Hello and welcome to this recorded lecture for the University of London Undergraduate Law Program. My name is Ioannis Glinovos and I'm a tutor in contract law. This presentation offers a summary of the main aspects of contractual agreement, focusing on offer and acceptance. I hope you will find the presentation useful and I'm looking forward to meeting you online in one of our live events. Formation of contract requires five distinct elements, offer, acceptance, consideration, intention to create legal relations and certainty. A contractually significant offer is defined as a statement that is certain enough for the other party to accept in its entirety without the need for further discussion. An offer that invites the other party to perform a specific action is a unilateral offer. See, for example, the case of Khalil versus Carbolic Smoke Wall. An acceptance needs to be unconditional assent to the terms of the offer and cannot introduce any new terms or make any amendments. A purported acceptance that introduces new terms will not be considered an acceptance that leads to a contract but a counteroffer, as in Hyde versus Rents. Consideration can be defined as an element of value contained in the promises made by the parties, see Thomas versus Thomas. Without this value underlying the promise, the exchange will lack the necessary legal validity to be deemed enforceable in a court of law. The requirement of intention to create legal relations plays a similar role to consideration. The difference between the two is that intention to create legal relations does not rely on concepts of value, but operates on the basis of presumptions to distinguish between social or domestic agreements and commercial agreements. Domestic agreements carry a presumption against enforceability, as in Balfour versus Balfour, while commercial agreements carry a presumption in favor of enforceability. The final requirement, certainty, permits the discussion as to formation of contract, as it works to ensure that the parties have a secure understanding of the contents and aims of their agreement. This first part of the presentation is focused on two key elements of contractual formation, that of offer and acceptance. The law of contract is about the enforcement of promises. Not all promises are enforced by courts, however. To enforce a set of promises or an agreement, courts look for the presence of certain, ele for the presence of certain elements. When these elements are present, a court will find that the agreement is a contract. This is a somewhat artificial process. To a certain extent, courts will find that some agreements simply look like contracts and then they reason backwards in order to find the elements necessary to form them. Be prepared, therefore, to be initially confused about the link between the law on contractual formation and the everyday experience of deal-making. To say that we have a contract means that the parties have voluntarily assumed liabilities with regard to each other. The process of agreement begins with an offer. For a contract to be formed, this offer must be uncon. The law imposes various requirements as to the communication of the offer and the acceptance. Once there has been a valid communication of this acceptance, the law requires that certain other elements that we will talk about later on are present. If these elements are not present, a court will not find that the contract exists between the parties. In the, in the absence of a contract, neither party will be bound to the tentative promises or agreements that they've made. It is thus of critical importance to determine whether or not a contract has been formed. We begin by discussing the nature of a contractual offer. It is important to understand that it is not the subjective intentions of the parties, legal effect of their words or actions, but how these would seem to an external observer. That is to say that the offer is interpreted according to an objective intention. This, in other words, is the interpretation the reasonable person in the position of the offeree would place upon the statement or action of the offeror. This is crucial in answering the basic question of what is an offer. We can say that an offer is an expression of willingness to contract on certain terms. It must be made with the intention that it will become binding upon acceptance. There must be no further negotiations or discussions required. 
it is very important to realize from the outset that not all communications will be offers. They will lack the necessary intention to be bound upon acceptance. If they are not offers, what are they? At this point, we will distinguish an offer from other steps in the negotiation process. These other steps in the negotiation process might include the statement of intention, supply of information, or an invitation to treat. Let's see a few of those in turn. A statement of intention where one party states that he intends to do something differs from an offer in that he is not stating that he will do something. An example is the case of Harvey v. Facey from 1893. Similarly, if one party provides information to the other party, he supplies the information to enlighten the other party. The statement is not intended to be acted upon. An invitation to treat is an indication of a weakness. It is an invitation to make an offer or to commence negotiations. Courts have considered whether or not a communication was an offer or an invitation to treat in a wide variety of circumstances. A display of goods is generally an invitation to treat and so is an advertisement, as in Partridge v. Crittenden in 1968, and so is a request for tenders. An auctioneer's request for bids is also an invitation to treat, which means that the bid is an offer. When the auctioneer brings his hammer down, then he has accepted the offer. To be effective, an offer must be communicated in the sense that the offeree, the person who will accept, knows of the existence of the offer. There can be no acceptance of an offer without knowledge of this offer. The reason for this requirement is that if we say that a contract is an agreed bargain, there can be no agreement without knowledge. There can be no meeting of the minds if one mind is unaware, if one mind is unaware of the other. Stated another way, an acceptance cannot mirror an offer if the acceptance is made in ignorance of the offer. The authorities are, however, divided on the need to communicate the offer. We now turn to acceptance. For a contract to be formed, there must be an acceptance of the, acceptance of the offer. The acceptance must be an agreement to each of the terms of the offer. It is sometimes said that the acceptance must be a mirror image of the offer. The acceptance can be by words or by conduct. Acceptance occurs when the offeree's words or conduct show to an objective observer that the offeree perors terms. If the offeree attempts to add new terms when he is accepting, then this is considered to be a counter-offer and not an acceptance. A counter-offer implies a rejection of the original offer, which is thereby destroyed and cannot be subsequently accepted. See, for example, Hyde v. Range from, from 1840. When the offeree queries the offer and seeks more information, this is neither an acceptance nor a rejection, and the original offer stands. In some cases, the parties will attempt to contract on different standard forms. In this instance, there will be what we call a battle offers and counter offers passing back and forth. The Court of Appeal held in the case of Butler Machine Tool from 1979 that the last shot is the one who wins this battle of the forms. The general rule is that acceptance is not effective unless it's been communicated to the offeror. This is sometimes expressed by saying that the acceptance cannot be made through silence. The offeror cannot waive communication because that would be to the detriment of the offeree. The general rule is displaced in the case of a unilateral contract. A unilateral contract is one where one party makes an offer to pay another if that other party performs some act or refrains from some act. The other party does not need to make a promise to do the act or refrain from it. In these cases, acceptance of the offer occurs through performance and there is no need to communicate acceptance in advance of this once. An example of the offer of a unilateral contract is an offer of a reward for the return of a lost cat, for example. 
In the case of Carlyle versus Carbolic smoke ball from 1893, it was established that performance is the acceptance of the offer and there is no need to communicate the attempt to perform. Communication of the acceptance is waived because it would be unreasonable for the offeror to rely on the absence of communication which would have been unnecessary or which no reasonable person would be expected to make. The rule that an acceptance must be communicated is also waived in the case of the postal rule. The exception was devised in the case of Adams and Linsell from 1818. This puts the risk of delay or loss on the offeror. It is important to remember that the rule is an exception to the general rule requiring communication. As modern forms of communication such as fax and e most instantaneous, courts have shown a marked reluctance to extend the postal rule to these new forms, forms of communication. See for example the case of Allianz Insurance from 2008. It is also important to remember that offers do not exist indefinitely. For the revocation of an offer to be effective, there must be actual communication of this revocation. It is not necessary for the revocation to be communicated by the offeror, however. Communication to the offeree through another reliable source will be sufficient. See, for example, the case of Manchester Council from 1970. It seems evident from the information presented already that the fundamental law of contract formation has retained the formalistic character of classical contract law. One could argue, however, that the offer and acceptance paradigm fits poorly with modern contracting practice. Is there still a need for such classical notions to determine contractual deals, especially since other notions, since other notions like consideration and intention to create legal relations seem to cover the same ground, namely, determining whether parties wish to be bound in a contract. Think about electronic transactions online. Do we still need to interpret contractual bargains in this stylistic manner, where everything happens at the click of a button? Be that as it may, English courts remain committed to a classical understanding of formation, and there are recent cases to prove it. For example, in Crest Nicholson v. Zakaria, from 2010, the court endorsed the traditional approach to determination of formation of contracts and the distinct tests that will apply to the question of formation interpretation. This decision emphasizes the necessity for parties to exercise caution when corresponding on matters that amount to an agreement of terms. This means that parties would do well to consider drawing up a simple agreement to reflect agreed terms or variations rather to rely on exchanges of, of correspondence, be clear and unequivocal when varying contract terms, including expressly stating that other terms remain unaffected, and any suspected mistakes or ambiguities during negotiations should be brought to the attention of the other party as soon as possible to avoid uncertainty and the potential for dispute at the last stage. It goes without saying that parties to contract negotiations should be aware that emails can create a legally binding contract, depending on the language used in them, and ensure that they specifically state in any email correspondence whether or not their emails are subject to contract. See Goel and Anor v. Grant from 2017. Offers do not exist indefinitely open for an indeterminate time awaiting acceptance. Indeed, some offers may never be accepted. There is no legal commitment until a contract has been concluded by the acceptance of an offer. Because there is no legal commitment until a contract has been formed, either party may change their mind and withdraw from negotiations. In situations where an offeror has stipulated that the offer will be open for a certain period of time, he or she can nevertheless withdraw the offer within that time period. This is called revocation. This will not be the case, however, where the offeror is obliged by a separate binding collateral contract to keep the offer open a specified period of time. For the revocation of an offer to be effective, there must be actual communication of the revocation. It is not necessary for revocation to be communicated by the offeror. Communication to the offeree through a reliable source is sufficient. 
See, for example, Manchester Diocesan Council versus Commercial and General Investments from 1970. If the offeree rejects an offer, the offer is at an end. As would be the case if the offeree makes a counteroffer. Different problems arise, however, when it is the offeree who changes his or her mind. For example, if after posting a letter of acceptance the offeree informs the offeror by telephone before the letter arrives that they reject the offer, should the act of posting an acceptance prevail over the information actually conveyed to the offeror? In the absence of a definitive answer in the case law, the question must therefore be answered primarily as a matter of principle. Tritel suggests that the issue is whether the offeror would be unjustly prejudiced by allowing the offeree to rely on the subsequent revocation. Where the offer is made subject to a condition which is not fulfilled, the offer terminates. The condition may be implied. The death of an offeree normally terminates the offer in that the offeree's personal representatives could not pursue or accept the offer. The offeror may also set a time limit for acceptance. Once this time has passed, the offer lapses. In other cases, the offeror can revoke the offer before the time period lapses provided that the offer has not been accepted. In cases in which no time period is stipulated for the offer, an offeree cannot make an offeror wait forever. The offeror is entitled to assume that acceptance will be made within a reasonable period of time or not at all. What a reasonable period of time is will depend on the circumstances of the case. What does one need to do to revoke an offer after it's been communicated? And could one revoke an acceptance sent by non-instantaneous means? Because there is no legal commitment until a contract has been formed, either party may change their mind and withdraw from negotiations. In situations where an offeror has stipulated that the offer will be open for a certain period of time, he or she, she can nevertheless withdraw the offer within this time period. This is called revocation. This will not be the case, however, where the offeror is obligated by, for instance, a separate binding collateral contract to keep the offer open for a specified period of time. For the revocation of an offer to be effective, there must be actual communication of the revocation. It's not necessary for revocation to be communicated by the offeror, see Dickinson and Dodds. Communication to the offeree through a reliable source is sufficient, see for example, Manchester the Ocean Council. The important point is that knowledge is there on the part of the offeree. This means that communications are not critical if the offeree has actual knowledge of the revocation. See Bern versus Tienhoven. On the issue of acceptance, it's difficult to preempt acceptance by instantaneous communication. The problem here lies in the postal rule if acceptance is sent by post. The rule was devised in the cases of Adams and Linzel and household fire insurance. The postal acceptance rule will only prevail in certain circumstances, however. It will prevail where use of the post was reasonably contemplated by the parties or stipulated by the offeror. However, it was held in Dunmore v. Alexander that postal acceptance can be revoked by faster means of communication. Note, however, that courts will not equate other forms of communication like email to the post. Therefore, if one sends an instant message to preempt an email containing an acceptance, this would preempt the acceptance. Hi guys, welcome to another video from your friendly lecture from around the corner. Today we're talking about how to approach an exam paper. In other words, how to dissect an exam paper when we're walking into an examination hall. So we're going to deal with some of the key issues that you're going to have to deal with and how you will approach them and what are the main pitfalls that you're trying to avoid. First thing that you need to think about is 
what do the instructions actually ask you to do? Because if you don't read the instructions, clearly you don't know what you're doing. One of the most common mistakes is that people don't read the instructions carefully. They don't estimate the time they've got available. They don't check how many questions they have to do, and they end up doing something really wrong, losing them a lot of marks and resulting very often in failure. You do not want to be those people. What are you supposed to do, therefore? You read your rubric of the exam carefully and thoughtfully and make sure that you understand what it is that you have to do. Once you're confident that you got how many, how much time you've got and how many questions you have to do, then you can move on to step two. Now, moving on to step two. Step two, read all the questions before you decide which ones you want to do. I know that this sounds fairly obvious, but we've got lots of people who make this mistake. You read the first question and you're thinking, oh, I know this one. This one is about, say, director's duties or something. I'll do that one. But it turns out it's not, or it turns out that the question after it is actually easier or something that you prepared a little bit more carefully. So it is crucial that you read all the questions thoroughly and carefully before deciding which ones to pick for your exam answer. Crucial, crucial skill, crucial thing to remember. Another key little trick while we're at this, once you make your decision, stick to it. You don't have the time to change your mind afterwards. The worst mistakes that we see are people who start answering a question and then after they've written a page or so, they decide they would rather be doing something else. They stop and they start from scratch. This means that you will run out of time and you won't be able to finish your exam properly. So don't do that. Make your careful selection and then stick to it. Another common and very terrible mistake is selecting to do a question on something that looks easy as opposed to a question on something that you've prepared. So it could be that you prepare the range of topics, but then you find like a short essay question that looks super easy and you're thinking, oh, come on, I'm going to do this. You start writing it and then after you've written a paragraph, you run out of things to say. Bad decision. Don't do this. Read the, careful, uh, the questions carefully, make your selection on the basis of what you actually know and what you have revised properly. Do not decide to do something random right on the minute, right on the day, because very quickly you're going to run out of things to say. One of the questions I normally get is whether you should be doing essay questions or problem questions. Um, this is something that you're going to have to think about, and my recommendation is that you're probably better off with problem questions rather than essays. Um, as regards the topics that you've revised, you have to be aware of one fact. It could be that you prepared the topic, but you prepared it as a problem and then it comes up as an essay. Or the other way around, you prepared a lot of sort of theory discussion on something you expected to come as an essay, but it turns out that it comes out as a problem. So be very careful with your selection on this one, because if you're prepared for one type and then you get it on another, maybe you won't be able to perform as good. So perhaps you should think about doing another question. You've read everything, you made your selections, you're confident about your selections, and then you jump straight in and you start writing. Big mistake. You shouldn't be writing anything unless you've done a plan for yourself. Structure is very important in your answers. And this is where things go horribly wrong because you've got it in your head, but the way that you're writing it down on paper does not communicate to me. And I'm your examiner, right? If I don't get what you're writing, it doesn't matter what you think you're writing. So for what you're writing to actually make sense, you have to keep your structure straight and you need to be clear about what you're talking about and how you're talking about it. So plan a little bit and plan carefully before you start writing down on paper and spending time writing your answer. Now, on issues of substance, what you're actually writing in there that you're going to get marks out of, are you really answering the question or are you reproducing what the textbook says? Another way to put this, are you actually answering the question that I said or are you answering a question that you prepared? Both of these things are a problem, because if you're just reproducing the textbook, it shows that you don't understand really what you're talking about, and you're not going to get full marks because you're not adequately answering the question. If, on the, on, the one, on the other hand, you're giving me an answer to a question that you prepared, but not the question that I'm asking, again, you're close, but you're not exactly what we're asking for. So you have to be very careful about what you're giving us. Don't give us the textbook. Don't give us your stock answer on director's duties that I know all of you are very well preparing and you're very keen on. 
answer the question that I actually said. If I'm not mistaken, you guys are law students. And what distinguishes a law student from any other student? Your ability to tell us what the law is and to do this appropriately. Therefore, mentioning adequate authority and offering the proper references and the proper citations to cases and statutes is what is necessary for you to pass this exam. If you're writing stuff and you're giving us your opinion of what the law might be without actually providing the references that validate that this is the law, you're not getting many marks. So think very carefully about references and citations every time you're putting down an answer, even though this is an exam paper. What is the thing that proves fatal in an exam? Bad timing. Keep your eye on the clock, because if you run out of time and you don't answer all the questions, obviously you're not going to get a very good mark. And think about it. If you're asked to do four questions, doing four giving four incomplete answers, even though they're not perfect, is much better than giving three perfect ones and then missing the other one entirely. Because even if you write something, even if it's terrible, um, just for the effort of writing something, I'm going to give you some marks for it. If you've written nothing at all, I'm not giving you any marks at all. So work out the math. Are you going to do better by having three questions that are perfect and one that's missing or writing four questions that are fairly average? I think the second option is going to get you the better marks. So timing, crucial. Don't run out of time. Answer all the questions as requested. Are you the sort of person that freaks out? Maybe you are, maybe you're not, but trust me, the majority of people in an exam setting will freak out. And if you're doing a traditional exam where you have to walk into an exam hall, it's quite possible that you're going to have this moment when you go, ah, I can't remember anything at all. It can happen. So be prepared for this. Be prepared for the stress that comes with an exam. Now, the only way to fight that stress is good preparation. The more you study, the better prepared you're going to be, the higher the chances of success. And I know it's going to be difficult, but do whatever you can to keep yourself calm when you're walking into the exam hall and when you're actually picking up your pen and starting on your paper. What is my favorite quote in regards to exams? Those who prepare well, do well. Obvious, isn't it? Well, I hope that you're going to take this advice and prepare perfectly for your exam. And the better you are prepared, the better your mark is going to be. Dana is the director of a construction company. In August, Heron Limited placed an advertisement in a newspaper asking for designs to be submitted to them for the construction of an extension to their warehouse in South London. The ad stated that the lowest cost proposal meeting council planning requirements would be awarded the contract. Dana sent her proposal within the specified deadline, but it was never received by Heron. She thinks she would have been awarded the contract had the proposal been received and wants to sue Heron for compensation. Advise Dana. In order to resolve problem questions effectively, you must identify the relevant legal issues, state the law correctly, analyze the issues applying the relevant law, and offer a conclusion that flows from your analysis. The issues relevant to Dana's problem are whether the ad placed by Heron is an offer or an invitation to treat. Secondly, whether if the ad is an offer, Dana accepted by posting her proposal, Thirdly, whether if the ad is not an offer, Dana made an offer to her on herself by sending this proposal. And fourth, whether a collateral contract exists between Dana and Heron. Advertisements placed in the press are usually invitations to treat and seldom unilateral offers. See Carlil vs. Carbolic Smokeball. Tenders, as is the case here, are also usually considered to be invitations to treat. See Blackfall vs. Field Aero Club. However, on the basis of the information in the ad, Dana may argue that this was a situation similar to an auction without reserve. See Warlow vs. Harrison. The consequence could be that a collateral contract was created that obligated Heron to at least consider her offer. If that contract existed and was breached, Dana could claim damages to compensate for costs expended in preparing her proposal.
to recap, the relevant issues are offer versus invitation to treat, competitive tenders and their status in the law, acceptance of offers by post and collateral contracts. A possible conclusion, therefore, is that if Heron's ad was an offer, Dana could claim that on posting her proposal she accepted, and it does not matter whether the letter was actually received or not. See the postal rule, Adams v. Lindsell. It is more likely, however, that the ad was not an offer. In that case, Dana had no remedy, unless she can claim on the basis of a collateral contract as detailed above. Dana is not likely to succeed in an action against Heron. Essay question. Adverts will always be considered invitations to treat. Discuss. Essay questions invite you to present the relevant law in the area under consideration and offer a reflection on the particular issue raised. The best way to approach essay questions is to view them as an opportunity to demonstrate your knowledge of the law. The best way to build a discussion is to compare and contrast different situations, case law or judicial opinions on the matter under consideration. You should start by explaining what invitations to treat are and distinguish them from contractual offers, mentioning relevant case law as illustrations. Invitations to treat are statements providing information not capable of being accepted in order to form a valid contract. The best way to answer the question set is to present different situations in which adverts can be found and examine whether in each case the information will be deemed to be an invitation to treat or a contractual offer. For example, advertisements in the press are normally considered to be invitations to treat, like in the case of Partridge v. Crittenden. However, when these adverts are specific enough or take the form of rewards, they can be considered unilateral offers, as in Carlyle v. Carbolic Smokeball. Advertisements on shop windows will normally be considered invitations to treat like in Fisher v. Bell. Adverts of promotions within shops will be considered invitations to treat, like in Pharmaceutical Society of Great Britain v. Boots. A possible conclusion to this discussion is that the premise of the question is incorrect. Not all adverts are considered invitations to treat. The outcome as to their legal significance will very much depend on the circumstances of each case. This presentation offered the summary of some of the main aspects of contractual formation, especially the function of offer and acceptance. We presented in detail the law in relation to offer and acceptance and discussed the concept of revocation. We also discussed some key things to pay attention to when preparing for exams and examined two sample exam questions, one in the form of a problem and another in the form of an essay question. We'll finish this video with a presentation of a question you can work on at home. Consider how you would respond to the following situation. Ado and Brioni are work colleagues. On the 1st of July, Ado met Brioni for a drink and told her he is looking for a new laptop. Brioni replied that he could have her own laptop as she does not use it anymore and is happy to sell it on. Brioni says she wants about £200 for it. That evening, Addo sent an email to Brioni saying, I accept your offer to sell the laptop for £200 and will transfer the money in a few days. On July 3rd, Brioni sent Addo an email that said, Don't be silly, I wouldn't sell the laptop for that, I want 250 for it. To avoid any further misunderstanding, do not email me again unless you do not want the laptop at this price. Addo was so annoyed on reading the first sentence of Brioni's email that he deleted it without reading further and did not reply. Three weeks later, Brioni rang Addo and demanded 250 offering to deliver the laptop. Advise Addo. How, if at all, would your answer differ if, upon reading Brioni's email on the 3rd of July, Addo decided to purchase the laptop for 250 and Brioni subsequently refused to deliver it?